Uh, our next speaker is Professor Mayo Moran, who is a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, Mayo completed her, uh, her master's in law at the University of Michigan and is currently in the process of, uh, of completing a doctorate in law at the University of Toronto. She's been involved in litigating uh, a number of constitutional cases uh, for and on behalf of LEAF uh, and has a background in constitutional litigation and, and theory. Uh, and without further ado, Mayo. But forward nation action So that's what I want to focus on is first of all just look at how do they get to that point it seems rather surprising when you think of, of um, the guarantee of equality in section 15 um, that they would place such a fundamental um, importance on on traditions fundamental values and after I just sort of go through the reasoning in Gontier's decision in Miron, which as you know is very, very heavily relied on, and I think somewhat surprisingly relied on by La Forêt in Egan, given that La Forêt is giving the reasons for judgment in Egan, it's a bit surprising that he relies so heavily on the dissent in Miron. After I go through that, I'd like to just discuss some of what I think are the most uh, fundamental difficulties with that view of discrimination. Some of them have been mentioned um, already. And then just lastly to talk about how you might reformulate some of the arguments um, in order to uh, sort of place discrimination at the center of the Section 15 inquiry again. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a road map. What I'd like to start by doing is just briefly um, summarizing the facts of the cases. I'm sure you're familiar with them. I'm not really going to focus very much on Thibodeau, although I think it's interesting and important. I'm going to talk more about the discrimination inquiry in Miron and in um, Egan. As I'm sure you know, um, Egan involved a spousal benefit that was available under the Old Age Security Act. Um, the um, John Nesbitt applied for it. He'd been in a relationship with Egan for 48 years. They qualified on all other grounds, but he was denied the benefit because he didn't fit the definition of spouse, which had a requirement of being the opposite sex without sort of going through too much detailed analysis. They sought a declaration to try to extend the definition of spouse to include same-sex partners. The Federal Court Trial Division dismissed that. The Federal Court of Appeal, a majority, upheld the dismissal, and the Supreme Court of Canada dismissed the appeal. The appeal, as you know, 5-4. Um, the reasons for judgment were given by La Forêt and what's been referred to as the relevant four concurred with, with him, um, that the definition of spouse, which uh, did not include same-sex partners, did not constitute discrimination within the meaning of Section 15, and so didn't even have to get to Section 1. I have to say, though, I thought it was interesting in terms of what it says about the relationship between this view of discrimination and what is left to do under Section 1, that uh, when La Forêt gives his little sort of one-paragraph statement of what he'd do under Section 1, he says, well, even if I found that this was discrimination, I would find that it wasn't just, it was justified for the reasons that I gave in my analysis of discrimination. So, you know, suggesting that the analysis of discrimination is basically just the same thing as what happens under Section 1, which is, I think, uh, fairly obvious difficulties in terms of understanding the different provisions of the Constitution. Um, as you know, Sapinka wrote for himself, he held that this um, definition of spouse did constitute discrimination, but since it was a new social relationship, 
interesting concept. Um, and this was a substantial step towards recognizing it. Also interesting since I, I couldn't detect any steps that had actually been made um, in the progress of that legislation. In fact, the legislation was always available both to married and to common law spouses. There was never a time at which it was available only to married couples and then extended to common law and Sapinka suggests, so the next thing is gonna be extending it to same-sex partners. There isn't really that indication of a progression, but Sapinka finds that there is, and on that basis, he says it could be upheld under very, very deferential understanding of section one. Uh, the dissent, as people here have mentioned, set, um, held to a more traditional view of Andrews, said that this constituted direct discrimination and um, was reinforced negative stereotypes about homosexual relationships and could not be saved by Section 1 because while there was this valid legislative purpose of providing assistance to elderly couples in need, there wasn't a rational connection between that purpose and the denial of a benefit to couples based on the fact of their sexual orientation. Um, in Miro and Trudell, which I'm not going to discuss as much, I'll just mention that the constitutional issue involved the definition of um, spouse, which was confined to people who were legally married, and um, it was upheld um, by the Supreme Court of, Ca or sorry, it was upheld by a motions court judge, and eventually. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada held narrowly that that definition violated Section 15, um, but the same minority that is Gontier, Laforet, Le Maire, and Major dissented on that point. The reason I think it's important to talk about both of these decisions, as I've mentioned, is that um, in, his major in his decision in Egan, Justice Laforet really doesn't give the main justification for why he's using the view of discrimination that he is, in order to find that you have to go to Gontier's dissent in Miron. And all of the more substantive reasons behind the analysis of discrimination are actually found in the judgment in Miron. So it's very important for that reason. So how do, how do they end up, that what I'm gonna call the La Forêt Gontier approach to discrimination, which is a new approach at least new under uh, Section 15 of the Charter. It's been suggested that it's, uh, it's very, very familiar in some senses, quite reminiscent of what happened under the Bill of Rights. Um, but how does this emphasis on tradition come to play a center, central role in the analysis of discrimination under the Charter? Um, I think that if you look at the laforet gontier analysis of discrimination, there basically it can be divided into three separate steps that eventually bring this idea of fundamental values and biological and social reality into the heart of the discrimination inquiry. So first of all, um, the third step of, of the analysis of discrimination is, is the most important step for everyone in these cases. It's, um, and in the opinion of Mr. Justice Laforet, relying on Gontier and Miron, he says that discrimination is based on what he takes to be irrelevant personal differences. That's a quote from Andrews. Um, but I think it's important to note that when McIntyre used this idea of irrelevant personal differences in Andrews, that was sort of the starting point for an analysis of discrimination that went on to focus on whether or not the use of certain distinctions perpetuated historical disadvantage and invidious stereotypes. However, for Gontier in Miron and Laforet in Egan, the notion of irrelevance is absolutely central to the idea of what discrimination is. Um, some, what that means is that there's going to be no discrimination, they take it, if you can find some reason why the legislature made the distinction in the first place. That's what the relevance test is all about. Um, and as other people have mentioned, it's worth noting that that looks a lot like the similarly situated test. However, 
and, and, and relying on this test, for example, in Egan, uh, Laforet is able to find a relevant difference between same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples. I mean, he has a little bit of trouble on this given, given the you know, lesbian adoption case that was before the Ontario courts at the same time, but nonetheless, he sort of stresses the capacity to procreate and says, well, this is what you know, heterosexuals can do, and that's very important to society, and so it's a relevant distinction, and on that basis, it can be upheld. So that looks a lot like the similarly situated test, but what I think is interesting about Laforet's judgment in Egan and, Mir and Gontier's in Miron is that they both actually criticize the similarly situated test as well. They say there's something wrong with it, um, you know, suggesting that they're going along with Andrews in, in this regard. But it's interesting to notice what it is they say is wrong with it. Um, so Laforet in Egan mentions, well, one of the problems with the similarly situated test is that it's extremely narrow, and it might lead you to miss ways in which people who, as he put it, puts it, initially appear to be similar might in fact be different. So he's criticizing the similarly situated test, saying it's very narrow, it might lead us to miss relevant differences between people. And uh, similarly in Miro and Trudel, um, Mr. Justice Gontier also talks about what's wrong with similarly situated test and says it doesn't really give enough scope for considering what he calls the reason for the distinction. Now that's an interesting critique of the similarly situated test because it's basically the opposite of what happened in Andrews. One of the focuses of what was wrong with the similarly situated test in Andrews was that it didn't consider the impact of the distinction from the point of view of the person who was disadvantaged by it. Um, but this critique of the similarly situated test instead focuses on the fact that there's not enough scope for consideration of why the distinction was there, and that is, in essence, consideration of the government or the legislator's point of view. So it's worth noting that they are relying on the similarly situated test. They're saying something's wrong with it. What's wrong with it is that it doesn't give enough scope for considering reasons why the legislator may have acted. And that is part of, don't forget, I know it sounds like section one, it's actually section 15. And so, in order to um, remedy this defect, they do something that I think is, is quite striking, and, and people have mentioned it since, um, or earlier. They bring in the idea of contextualizing. The idea of contextualizing is brought in to remedy the perceived weakness of the similarly situated test, which is it doesn't give enough scope for the legislator's point of view. Um, this is sort of a, an unusual use, at least if you sort of are following what's happening in equality law, of the idea of contextualizing. And you know, in some ways, I, I felt when I first read this that it's, you know, a lot of people who are disadvantaged have been arguing for equality by saying you have to pay attention to context. I mean, that's been one of the major arguments that we've used. And I sort of feel in, you know, in Egan and Miro and Trudell, like, you know, they're going, okay, you want context? Here's context. I mean, it's a very different view of context than what, what's been used and what's been traditionally argued by equality seekers. Now, I mentioned in my paper, and I actually think it's an important consideration. In some ways, it's been the call to context has been useful for people who've been disadvantaged because it is a neutral argument. It looks like a neutral argument. We can say, you know, pay attention to context, and it doesn't sound like we're, we're saying, just pay attention to us. But the fact is that I think in some ways the, the majority in, in Egan and the dissent in Miro and Trudell is kind of taking advantage of or using the neutrality of the call to context and saying, okay, context, well, that can mean anything. I mean, we can situate this in any way that we want, and they're bringing in the state's point of view into section 15. Um, I think in some ways that um, 
there is a way of remedying that by focusing more particularly on what context equality seekers are, are, think is important under Section 15, and the enumerated analogous grounds give you some sense of that. Um, so we have, first of all, this notion of, of relevance, and then in order to contextualize the similarly situated test, we have the idea of contextualizing brought in. But I think, in a way, the most um, significant aspect of the sort of three different uh, um, elements in, in the, this new idea of discrimination is what counts as context. And it's really in Gontier's decision in Miron that you get a clear statement of that. Laforet sort of talks about it a little bit, but he doesn't really state it directly. I think um, at, um, in, in, in uh, Gontier's discussion, it's very interesting that after he says we have to contextualize, very next paragraph, he starts out and he says, um, more specifically, an indispensable element of the contextual approach to section 15.1 involves an inquiry into whether a distinction rests upon or is the expression of some objective physical or biological reality or fundamental value. Okay, so that is what contextualizing means, and that's sort of the third vital uh, new element in this approach to discrimination that the majority in, Mir in Egan, the dissent in Miron, are bringing into the analysis of Section 15. And it's interesting that over and over again in, in Laforest's judgment and in, e and in Gonchet's judgment, they say, well, it may be the case that this distinction merely reflects a biological reality or a fundamental value. And I always think it's interesting when the word mere is used. It's, it's all, it always tells you something. And, and over and over again, they, they suggest merely reflecting a biological reality or fundamental value. What's the implication? Therefore, it's relevant. If it's relevant, it's not discriminatory. And I think it's fairly clear if you look at the, the reasons for judgment in Egan um, that if the judicial imagination is sufficiently willing, which it appears it is in this situation, um, they will have no trouble dis discovering a functional value that's related to some sort of fundamental social purpose. And in fact, that's what uh, Laforet does in Egan and Gonchet does in Miron Trudel. So just to kind of summarize what, how these three factors, relevance, context and tradition or fundamental values kind of fit together in this new analysis of discrimination. I think what it means is that, it's fairly clear from the judgment, you have a distinction that denies equal benefit to someone on the basis of membership in a group identified by an enumerous or analog uh, analogous ground. Nonetheless, that will not be discriminatory. I mean, Gontier and Laforet both say over and over again, an otherwise prejudicial distinction, okay? So there, nonetheless, will not be discriminatory if it's relevant to a fundamental value or biological or social reality. So what you have is that the idea of fundamental values brought into Section 15 through the notion of context is actually limiting the concept of what will count as discrimination in the anti-discrimination section of that provision. Now, why is this a problem? Um, it seems to me to be a problem for so many reasons that it's almost hard to start to enumerate them, but I guess I'd just like to focus on a couple of the major difficulties with this analysis. Um, first of all, I think it at least the Supreme Court has said since Andrews that um, Section 15 protected individuals not only against overt intentional discrimination, but also against systemic and unintentional discrimination. I think it's, first of all, extremely difficult to imagine a situation in which if you applied this view of discrimination, which focuses on some sort of relevance to a functional value, you could ever find that systemic discrimination contravened the charter. 
The whole point of systemic discrimination is that it's based on fundamental values that hold stereotypes about individuals on the basis of their membership in particular groups. And given that this idea of discrimination focuses so closely on finding some reason for a distinction, I think it's impossible to imagine a situation in which any form of discrimination that wasn't overt and intentional would ever fall afoul of the discrimination guarantee in Section 15. But I think if you look at the, at the analysis, it's even very, very difficult to imagine a situation where discrimination that does seem to be fairly overt and intentional will fall afoul of Section 15. I mean, after all, if you look at the, the situation in Egan, there was a distinction drawn clearly denied a benefit on the basis of membership in what they said at least they agreed was an analogous ground. And yet, nonetheless, they held that because it was related to a fundamental value, it wasn't discriminatory. Now, the obvious problem that I think this raises is what about when our fundamental values are discriminatory? I mean, presumably the whole point of Section 15 is that there are certain areas in which our traditions are not a very reliable guide to what the right thing to do is. I mean, Section 15, in a sense, and particularly the enumerated and analogous grounds, is an injunction to read tradition critically. I mean, it tells us where we make mistakes in our traditions and in our fundamental values. But if you use this idea of discrimination, the idea of fundamental values actually ends up trumping the concept of discrimination in Section 15. In fact, it occurred to me um, in uh, Justice Gontier's uh, dissent in Miron, he discusses the case of Loving v. Virginia, which is um, an American Supreme Court case that held finally in 1967 that the state of Virginia's prohibition on interracial marriage was unconstitutional. I mean, Gontier cites this and says, yes, this shows that marriage is a fundamental right. But I actually think it's difficult if you take his view of discrimination seriously, he would have had difficulty, in fact, even finding that the prohibition on interracial marriage in Loving v. Virginia was discriminatory. After all, the state of Virginia argued, first of all, it was based on a biological and social reality, the difference between the races. And it also argued that it expressed the fundamental values of the state of Virginia. They pointed to all sorts of other states that did this. They showed the long tradition that of, of the, this kind of legislation. They went through constitutional debates to show that the framers of the 14th Amendment didn't intend the 14th Amendment to uh, abrogate this kind of legislation. So they had lots of evidence, in fact, more than there's given in Egan, for that matter, that this was a fundamental value. How could this view of discrimination even pick up something as blatant as that? It's not clear. I mean, you would think that you would look at it and say, well, but it draws a distinction on the basis of an enumerated or analogous ground. But so did the legislation in Egan. Yet, because it expressed a fundamental value, it was held to be non-discriminatory. Um, and so, just to um, sort of summarize, I guess, I think that um, other people have suggested some of the difficulties with um, this view of discrimination and um, that it basically eviscerates Section 15, which I think it does. Um, the question of how you can address it is, I think, a rather difficult one. I think, in, in part, it's important to formulate very, very carefully what the relevant idea of context is under Section 15. It's clear in much um, pre-Andrews and Andrews Supreme Court jurisprudence that when you're interpreting a guarantee under the Charter, you were supposed to do so by looking at the purpose of the guarantee, but the purpose of the guarantee means from the perspective of the individuals whose interest that guarantee was intended to protect. And in Section 15, that would mean looking at the individuals who have membership in those 
groups that are identified by the enumerated and analogous grounds. So I think part of it is to emphasize very, very clearly what does the call to context mean and what are the weaknesses with focusing on an idea of context that imports a notion of fundamental values that is so strong that almost nothing is left to the concept of discrimination. Thank you. Thank Mayo. She's said half of what I'm going to say, so that means I can be a lot shorter, and I appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is Peter Jervis. Um, Peter worked for a, a year in the Constitutional Law and Policy Division uh, of the Ministry of the Attorney General in Ontario, and since that time has been with Lerner and Associates, where he's a partner, practices, uh, focuses on constitutional litigation, <clears throat> among other things. Uh, Peter was counsel for the Interfaith Coalition uh, on Marriage and the Family, uh, an intervener in the Egan case. Uh, and uh, he and I had much pleasant banter in the halls before, during, and after that case, and, and uh, um, uh, he <clears throat> has occasionally, certainly from my perspective, been, uh, uh, been asked to, uh, to wear the black hat. Uh, he's a consummate advocate, uh, a consummate lawyer who defends his client's interests uh, diligently, uh, but with respect for his opponents. So it's my pleasure to introduce him to you today. Thank you, David. Um, I, should, uh, I should declare my taints right at the beginning. David was incorrect in a part of his introduction because after I left the AG's constitutional law group, I went and worked for John Sapinka. You can all hiss if you want to. And, um, and I worked uh, with John Sapinka for a, a period of time before his appointment uh, to the Supreme Court of Canada and then went and worked for Learner and Associates. Um, uh, I don't think he listened to any of my ideas when I was working for him, and I suspect he doesn't listen to any of my ideas now. Um, litigation's a funny business. Uh, um, one of the uh, uh, senior partners of the firm that I work at, a, a fellow named Earl Cherniak, some of you may have met Earl, uh, consummate counsel, I was in the Court of Appeal uh, this spring, and he was arguing this case very strongly. And the judges said to him, well, Mr. Cherniak, the problem is, is that we have a decision of our own that goes dead against you. And he said, yeah, but you shouldn't pay any attention to it. It's wrongly decided. And they said, but Mr. Cherniak, you were lead counsel in that case, and you won it. And he said, yeah, but, but the other fellow didn't make the argument that I'm making to you today, and it's the right argument. If you'd listen, you know, if I'd argued, you would have decided the other way, so now you can correct the law that I made 12 years ago. Um, now, of course, the role of counsel is, is, as we all know, who are litigators, uh, perhaps as opposed to, to those who, who um, are, are, are commentators or scholars, is that sometimes we, we are confronted with trying to distill and present an argument to advance our client's interest, and we don't have the luxury of saying, well, is this the, the best argument or the only argument? We say, are these arguments available? And uh, I was in an interesting situation about a year ago because, in fact, David and I first met at a, in this room, at a, I believe, in a, at a Law Society conference last June, and uh, it was dealing with uh, sexual orientation and the, or sorry, sexual orientation and the law. And I gave a paper, sexual orientation and the charter. And in that paper, uh, June of '94, um, uh, which was quite long and fairly, I, I hope, well researched, I basically uh, poo-pooed the uh, the two-to-one decision in the Federal Court of Canada in Egan and said, you know, the reasoning in this appears to be quite circular and uh, intellectually one queries uh, whether it will last five minutes in the Supreme Court of Canada. And if you look at the dissenting decision of Justice Linden, I believe, and if you look at what uh, Susan Greer, uh, Justice Susan Greer did in, in uh, Leyland, uh, you know, it's clear that there's going to be a tidal wave of, of support for uh, uh, Section 15 issues in the area of sexual orientation, and we all know what's going to happen. And uh, look at these crazy judges uh, trying, to, trying to somehow justify what appears to be fairly clear discrimination. Well, that was June of 94, and uh, of course, then we get the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in, uh, in Egan, and we're scratching our heads saying, well, how could they have done that? Everybody knew that they weren't going to do that and that they couldn't do that. Um, these things aren't uh, as clear. Um, uh, another point, which, which is also not clear, is, is uh, 
um, I've listened to the to the criticism of these decisions, and it appears to be you know that uh, there are uh, this this uh, group of four. Uh, I've heard the phrase "gang of four. Uh, I've given you a paper in an initial draft. I think I had them. Uh, called the team of four, and then I thought maybe that's uh, something I don't want to be found in a paper that uh, they might read, so I've called them the four minority justices. But the interesting thing is that, uh, number one, that position lost. The view that you've heard so much criticized here is a minority position. Four judges in Miron and four judges in Egan had this uh, contextual analysis in Section 15, and they were the losers. Five judges said we reject that approach and we prefer uh, what uh, Mary Ebert has uh, you know, called the approach of the Andrews purists. Um, that's the winning position right now in this country. So if you go in and argue a Section 15 case, you hold up Justice McLaughlin and you hold up uh, Justice Corey and, and uh, Justice LaRue Bay and you say that's the law. Um, now I don't think it's quite as clear as that and, and I've written this this little paper, which I, I don't know if you picked up, and if you haven't, there's copies around. And, and I don't usually read papers, but I'll read the first paragraph, because um, I kind of like it. Um, and what I said in that first paragraph is, <clears throat> commentators and legal scholars can be certain of a number of things after reviewing the recent Section 15 trilogy from the Supreme Court of Canada. First and foremost, they can be certain that there is a profound uncertainty in the direction of Section 15 charter analysis. So stopping there, I'm not sure that I share the very uh, negative view that Mary Eberts has given that, you know, this is the slippery slope and we're, 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 we're if not halfway down at the bottom of the slope. Um, I think we're in a real time of flux and confusion. Second, far from clarifying the future direction of Section 15 analysis, the court has spoken with numerous and conflicting voices. Third, there seems to be a fundamental dispute about the threshold the very threshold for Section 15 analysis, specifically whether there's a contextual component or a requirement for contextual analysis in the Section 15 inquiry. Now, stopping there, I do say something different than the speakers that have gone before me, the learned speakers that have gone before me, and what, what uh, the learned, the very learned speaker that will go after me. And what I say that's different is simply that I don't think that we have four justices in this case kind of creating a new test. Um, uh, in fact, Mary Eberts didn't say that they're creating a new test. She said this, is, this has been coming and it's just been made worse and perhaps it's been made more profound. I agree it's been coming and I agree that the theoretical roots for the decision of uh, Justices uh, Gontier and, uh, and Laferre in Egan and Miron uh, find their basis in Andrews um, and find their basis in a number of other of the Supreme Court of Canada's decisions. Um, now that's not to say that their solution is the correct solution. That's not to say that Justice McLaughlin's solution is the correct solution. I'm, not, uh, I, I'm simply saying that you have a couple of different approaches which seem to find their roots in the decisions. And some can say, well, the, the four minority justices of the gang of four have contorted what was there before, but the point is it was there before and they're trying to figure out what, what they think it means. And I think that the court's going to take a few more kicks at the can before it figures out what this all means. Now, just on that point, you know, one of the key criticisms of, uh, uh, excuse me, one of the key criticisms of the decision is this, is this, uh, um, this focus back on the functional values and tradition and, and what have you, I don't think that's the fundamental issue. I think the fundamental issue is the threshold issue. Is there a contextual analysis within Section 15 or does it belong in Section 1? Because if there is a contextual analysis, then how do we do it? If there isn't a contextual analysis, then maybe this is like 2B where you've got very broad parameters and just about every form of expression gets through 2B if it's not a form of violence, and really you, you test it under Section 1. And I think what the court's really struggling with is do we have a very broad Section 2B approach to Section 15 or are we going to narrow it? The, the, the group of four judges said we're going to narrow it and perhaps significantly, and of course the way they did it has troubled people. The point is they're saying we're going to narrow it. Other judges are saying we're not. And of course, the problem is, is that the roots of this contextual analysis 
are found right back to Andrews. Now let me, let me just look at some of the language um, that, that people may find troubling. Here's a passage I'll read to you. The issues, these issues go to the heart of a society's code of sexual morality and are, in my view, properly left for resolution to Parliament. Once again, however, I think it important to bear in mind that the legislature has chosen, blah, blah, blah. The legislature has concluded, blah, blah, blah. Once again, we are faced with distinctions aimed at biologically different acts that go to the heart of a society's morality and involve considerations of policy. They are, in my view, best left to the legislature. And then skipping down, this may be an unjust state of affairs, but it is not the special form of injustice section 15 one is designed to address. And we all sort of throw our hands up and say, my God, you know, they're deferring to Parliament, uh, this obsequious deference to Parliament, uh, the judges should have courage. Of course, that was Justice Wilson in Hess. And Justice Wilson, of course, is the champion of, of, of Section 15 analysis directed at writing the historical discrimination of those uh, who are historically oppressed and vulnerable and disadvantaged. But those are the words of Justice Wilson in Hess uh, justifying a, a gender-based distinction in the criminal code. You know, this is something that Parliament's done. It's based on uh, a, a contextual analysis of the legislation, and uh, Section 15 isn't going to kick in. Now, you know, that's part of the, the law that uh, the gang of four, as they're called, resorted to in trying to justify the approach. Here's another passage. Um, I'll just read the bottom of a paragraph talking about what discrimination really means. The admittedly unattainable ideal of equality should be that a law expressed to bind all should not, because of irrelevant personal differences, have a more burdensome or less beneficial impact on one than another. Justice McIntyre in the seminal Section 15 decision in Andrews. Now, most of the judges, except Laferre, as I recall, were with Justice McIntyre. What did that mean? I think what these four minority justices are trying to do is say, well, does that have any meaning? Um, in, 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 interestingly, as, as Mary Ebert reflected, and I didn't hear some of the other papers, but she reflected that Justice Iacobucci in Symes used this contextual approach. And uh, there's a passage that I, I, can, uh, I can read to you, but I, I won't take the time. But uh, it's clear in, in, in uh, Symes that Justice Iacobucci went on and on about the need to do a Section 15 analysis uh, looking at the overall context, not just the context of is there a group that's been historically disadvantaged that the legislation is uh, intending to ameliorate their, their suffering. He's saying, look at the legislative context, what's this particular uh, uh, provision intended to accomplish, et cetera, et cetera. All of the terrible stuff that, they, that they've done in, uh, in Egan and Miron. Um, well, Symes, uh, Yakabuchi did it in Symes. Of course, he wasn't one of the that's, that's, that's the buzzer that I've, you know, he, that's the hook. <laughs> he wasn't one of the justices that was part of this, uh, this group of four. And yet, uh, as Mary Ebert uh, so very well knows, uh, he was the justice that, uh, that uh, socked it to the, uh, to the appellant in Symes and said, uh, sorry, you're not going to get past first base in, in a Section 15 analysis because we prefer to use a contextual approach to, to cut your claim down at the, at the knees. And, uh, and all of us who've done charter cases have had the court say to us, well, you don't have the right evidence or you don't have the right this or the right that. You know, there are all sorts of reasons judges can use to, to um, throw you out. But the point is, is that, by the way, Justice Yakabusi also focused on this meaning of irrelevant personal characteristics and the part that that played in the second step of the, uh, of the um, Andrews test. Um, and then there's another case, of course, and that is Rodriguez. And, and I brought the passage along with me, uh, pages uh, 22 and 23 uh, on the Supreme Court of Canada's original version of, of Justice Lemaire's decision, where he, he looks at, uh, Chief Justice Lemaire, where he looks at what he did in Swain, talking all about this contextual analysis, and then he uh, uses that in Rodriguez in his Section 15 analysis. Now, all of that's to say that, that these four minority justices in, uh, did not simply pull out of the air a third step uh, and invent it in the Andrews test. I think what they did is they used these principles uh, to try to justify a result that uh, they felt they, they, uh, they wanted to arrive at. I think in fairness to them, they also said, what do these words mean? What does this part of the analytical test mean? Now, 
we didn't hear this, this crescendo of criticism when, when Justice Wilson in Turpin talked about the need for a contextual analysis. You know, that famous passage of looking at the larger socio-philosophical and et cetera, et cetera. You know, we thought that's a good idea. Look at what Section 15 was intended to accomplish. When in Hess, Justice Wilson um, basically said even a gender-based discrimination, clearly an enumerated ground, which clearly imposes a disadvantage, a higher sentence, um, even that doesn't get through the Section 15 hurdle because we're going to look at the larger context and we're going to look at social policy reasons. We did not have a huge criticism. Now, we do have a criticism of these judges, and I'm not here to say that criticism uh, should not be listened to and shouldn't be taken seriously. I'm simply saying, let's stop and see what they did and what they didn't do and where they did it. And so if I can leave you with one point, because we don't have a lot of time, but if I can leave you with one point, it's that there is a theoretical basis for what these judges did, and I think that basis um, has to be dealt with. We can't just sort of slap them with the back of our hands and say they're just inventing something that uh, because they're a bunch of conservatives and we shouldn't pay attention to them. I think we've got to say what's in the jurisprudence, what was it that they were struggling with, and what do we do with it in the future? Because I, I think that we're going to have to deal with these issues and sort out the law in the future. Right now it's a bit of a mess. Um, now, in the paper, um, what, uh, what I've tried to do is to is to set out just an analysis um, in summary form of what the court did in, in Egan and Miron. And uh, I just leave that with you. I think those of you that haven't read these decisions will, will, will have uh, some interesting times ahead of you. Those that have read them, uh, I've just tried to summarize what the four minority justices did um, factually. What I've done in, uh, in the latter part of the paper is to starting in page 13, set out what I call the historical basis for the contextual approach. And I really have told you what, what I have to say about that. I think that there is a clear um, basis in the previous jurisprudence. And interestingly enough, um, that basis is found in, in Justice Wilson, in Turpin and Hess, Justice Akabuchi and Symes. Uh, I believe in uh, Rodriguez that I referred to, it was Corey and Lemaire. And, uh, and so Corey, Yakabuchi and, Terp and uh, Wilson, they were not part of the group of four, and yet the group of four relies heavily on, on, on their interpretation of 15. So we have to think, what does that mean, and what's that going to mean in the future? Because I think anybody that tries to stand up and say, well, this group of four uh, conservative judges, let's hope that they, uh, you know, let's hope that somebody gets appointed to, when it's turned time to replace them that has a more progressive view, that may not answer the question. And, and anybody who's going to argue these cases probably has to deal with with, uh, with, with some of the background. Um, another point that I make in this paper, and I can tell you, I was asked to try to look at their reasoning and try to understand it and explain it to you um, in a way that would, that would help you deal with it. Um, and and the, th the third part, starting in page 18 of the paper, is entitled Relevancy and the Focus on Irrelevant Personal Characteristics. And what I say there is that you know, this, this test, which, which uh, Justice Gontier calls the third step, uh, I'm not so sure I agree with him, but he's a Supreme Court of Canada judge, so I guess you have to pay attention to him. But I think it's more like another part of the second step, or in the paper I call it two-step plus. So I guess you've got two-step, three-step, two-step plus. And really what I say is, um, right back to Andrews, that passage I read to you on page 165, Justice McIntyre said, you know, is the distinction based on irrelevant personal characteristics? Um, let me stop here in case, you know, I, I'm assuming that all of you are pretty familiar with the jurisprudence, but, you know, step number one of the Section 15 analysis, does the impugned legislation create a distinction based on one of the enumerated or analogous grounds? So is there a distinction and is it based on one of these personal characteristics? Now, we all know that the test for analogous grounds now is quite broad and properly should be quite broad, and therefore will include you know, a wide variety of personal characteristics which are difficult to change. Step number two, does this distinction based on these grounds cause a problem, deny, impose a burden, deny an advantage? Now, stopping there, as I read Justice McLaughlin, she seems to be saying that that's probably the end of the inquiry. And if you pass those two hurdles, 
you probably go into section one and any form of justification, balancing, contextual analysis all happens in section one. That's the majority view of the court. Now, of course, that view ignores what this phrase used in Andrews said, that the distinction which causes the discrimination must be based on irrelevant personal characteristics. Now, what does that phrase mean? And frankly, I don't know the answer. Four of the judges say they think they know what it means. I'm not so sure that that's the end of it. Um, I've discussed this with other constitutional scholars and they think that those words meant another thing. But the point is, is that they mean something. Now, what these judges said is, those words in the previous decisions give us a third step in the analysis. And that is, you know, by irrelevant personal characteristics, do we mean that if there's a relevant characteristic, relevant to the law, somehow you can have a, a distinction which causes discrimination, imposes a burden, but it's based on a relevant characteristic and therefore we don't get out of 15. And the group of four say that's, that's the test. Justice McLaughlin says you don't even ask that question. Now, I think Justice McLaughlin may end up, she, she's prevailing right now, and if she does, section 15 is a lot like 2B. You get a fairly, you know, um, a fairly easy passage through 2B, and then you hit the wall in section one. And maybe that's how these cases are gonna be decided in the future. And Justice Sapinka went one way in Egan, and he went the other way in Miron, and hence we have a section one decision, which is really what these cases are all about, section one. Um, apart from all the furor about the group of four, that's where they were decided. Is that gonna be the story for 15? Or are we gonna have this second step plus or third step where we have all of this focus on the functional values, tradition, legislative context, et cetera, et cetera, and I agree with the critics that that is importing a lot of what used to be done under section one into 15 and it's going to be very difficult for applicants. And I say that as somebody who's representing a minority group going to the court of appeal who got hammered on my section 15 argument um, because, I, because the, the test that was used against me was, was, was made so tight. The door was so narrow I couldn't get through it to get into section one where I had a great case. Um, so there's no question that if the group of four prevails we're gonna have a very strict 15 test and it's gonna be very tough to get cases through there. Um, if the McLaughlin view prevails, we're gonna be like freedom of expression. You know, just sharpen your knives on least intrusive means and, uh, and uh, you know, did the government really have a reasonable basis for this limitation? Because that's where the cases are all gonna be decided. And I think that, uh, that uh, my own view is that I think that there is intellectual merit in considering whether or not there should be something more than simply a two-step approach. I think that it may make sense to consider the third step. Um, there's certainly a basis for it. I'm not saying that my own view is that it should be there because counsel like me and the people that I represent um, are gonna have a very tough time getting, getting through 15. Um, now, stopping there, and, and David, I don't know when I'm supposed to sit down. Twelve or roughly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got a bit more. I've got a bit more time then. Stopping there, I think that my own my own uh, interpretation of the of the criticism of essentially Miron and Egan, and I, I'm leaving Thibodeau uh, up to Mary Ebert, who knows a lot more about it than I do. But looking at Miron and Egan, I think the main reason for the criticism is number one, the conceptual approach used by the judges, but number two the tools they used for this contextual analysis. And people were very troubled by um, their focus on tradition, uh, a very conservative uh, uh, focus on uh, heterosexual spousal units, uh, perhaps a view that reflects the Canadian society of, of 20 years ago or 50 years ago and not the Canadian society of today. That may be a legitimate criticism of what they've done in, in, in using the contextual analysis, but, but of course, what we have to recognize is that if we don't have that contextual analysis, we may still have a degree of arbitrariness in, in the Section 15 analysis. The reason I say that is as follows. As I understood the two-step approach, the question to be asked um, was whether or not the law in question um, was, was uh, directed to ameliorating the condition of his, uh, historically, socially, politically uh, disadvantaged.
And of course, that involves an analysis of who do we think was historically advantaged? Is this a good law or a bad law? The values that the judge has in approaching that um, uh, stereotyping analysis are going, to ref are going to reflect themselves in the decision that that judge uh, comes out with. So therefore, in the, in the two-step approach, there is a degree of arbitrariness, um, I think. Now, in the three-step approach, the criticism is that there's a lot of circularity um, because uh, your assumptions will inform your conclusion about the functional values uh, of the legislation and whether or not the personal characteristic is relevant or irrelevant. So I guess the question is, have they replaced uh, a limited amount of arbitrariness in the Section 15 approach with a large degree of circularity? Um, are we much further ahead or further behind? That's assuming, of course, that the Group of Fours approach is followed in the future. Now, I hope that I'm not confusing you. I hope I'm adding some clarity to this. The bottom line is I think that we have to ask the fundamental question of, you know, is, is Section 15 a pure political grab bag or are there some clear conceptual principles? Um, if there's some clear conceptual principles which involve a three-step approach, then the questions to be asked in the future are how do we define the functional values? I mean, if, if Justice Gontier, who I don't, know the, I don't know the man at all, but my understanding is that he's quite a, a strong Catholic um, and, and a very traditional person. You know, if his understanding of, of what are fundamental values in a society and important functional values that underlie legislation, if, if he's prepared to allow those to inform this decision of what's a relevant personal characteristic and what's irrelevant, well, is that not arbitrary? You know, similarly, if Justice Wilson in Turpin is prepared to say there is a strong, sound policy reason why the legislature can have different treatment of male and female people who have sex with children under the age of 14, um, and there's a sound policy reason for differentiating, that's the Hess case, for differentiating, is that, is that an arbitrary decision in the sense that that reflects a particular value? Most of us would share that value, but does that reflect a, a particular value that she is able to use to say this case doesn't even get through Section 15? into Section 1. Is, is Justice Gontier being any more arbitrary or circular in his reasoning than Justice uh, Wilson was in Hess? If Justice Wilson was being the same in Hess, then are we any further behind or further ahead? Um, so if, if, I can, if I can end on this note, and you may have some questions, but if I can end on this note, I would say that I'm not sure that we're further behind. I'm not sure we're further ahead. I think we are in a state of flux and confusion. Um, and I think that it's going to take further cases um, and, and further representations by Mary Eberts and uh, the other counsel here uh, to try to sort out uh, where these issues are going. Um, now, I don't know if there's any questions uh, or whether to uh, turn it over to David. Well, if I finish early, then we can just throw the floor open and discuss stuff. result of the uh, appearance of a thief at my house the other day, this will be a little more freewheeling <clears throat> and perhaps less discreet than it otherwise would be, but maybe that will be more fun. The, I want to pick up on a theme that Mayo uh, introduced in her remarks about fundamental values trumping charter rights, because that's what's going on in the decision of Justice Laforet and uh, Justice Gontier uh, in uh, Egan and in Miron Trudeau. The first question a judge must ask herself or himself when adjudicating one of the equality claims under Section 15, or indeed any of the charter jurisprudence, is where are the values located which inform the uh, judge, uh, the judicial process, the, the, the process of making a decision? And anybody who thinks that a judge is some neutral machine that is uh, uh, objectively applying rules or principles which exist independently and uh, out there somewhere uh, hasn't been reading any jurisprudence for the last 30 years, or indeed for the last 50. That's just a lot of nonsense. Nobody really believes that. The question is where do judges look to locate the principles which should be applied? 
And it is my contention that in Egan, uh, in the decision of, or the, the judgment of Mr. Justice Laforet, and the judgment of Mr. Justice Gantier in uh, Miron and Trudel, is a blatant natural law decision. It's the first one in our constitutional jurisprudence since the charter was passed from our senior court. Uh, it's very dangerous. Uh, and it is indefensible um, in, uh, in terms of basic principles of jurisprudence. Where uh, Justice Laforet and Justice Gantier find the principles uh, is they pick them out of the air. They are natural, they are biological, they are fundamental, and they are not located in the Charter. They're located in the hearts and minds of Justice Laforet and Justice Gantier. They believe the propositions that they are spouting Spouting is perhaps a, a, a little cheeky, uh, but really spouting uh, have some sort of primeness. They trump the charter. The institution of marriage as a social institution is prior to the charter. And they don't find any place to locate this other than biological reality or fundamental values. Whose values? Whose realities? They don't say. What they do not confront in their judgments, and I'm going to go back through them a little more carefully, what they do not confront in their judgments is why this value, this institution, is necessary. It necessarily excludes the claims which were advanced in the Egan case, why they're inconsistent. Uh, and uh, effectively, a subtext in the Egan decision is that the family is a zero-sum game and that the inclusion of other groups and benefits programs in some sense derogates from this institution they view as so fundamental. They do not say why. They do not, answer, they do not address that point. It is simply assumed. It's very, very difficult to debate with somebody over a, a, an issue like this when they simply say that the reason for their decision is that it's fundamental. It's just a judgment. It's it just pulled out of the air. You just sit there mutely and say, well, I, you know, you may have that view. Um, but that's, that's not a reason. That's just a declaration. They say that hard cases make bad law. Um, Egan should have been an easy case. Egan is a case about formal equality. This is not one where the judges have to reach into the mists of general social context in order to try to decide whether the law really does create a disadvantage. That's what all the discussion about contextualizing uh, does in those previous cases, is to look, take a broad look at the social, historical, political, economic background to decide whether or not the law creates a disadvantage on an impermissible basis. By introducing the principle of relevance what, what Justice Laforet and Justice Gontier are saying is that there may be circumstances where it is relevant and justified to discriminate against people, to, to draw distinctions against their interests on the basis of these enumerated grounds. And both judges start their judgments by saying, we must have judicial deference, we must defer to the legislature, we must not uh, make a broad incursion into the legislative uh, sphere. This is the introductory remark, perhaps the overriding concern, and this has been mentioned to you before. Nowhere in those judgments have we seen any indication of why it is that the legitimate business of our legislatures will grind to a halt if our legislators are prohibited from drawing these distinctions against people. Let, let's think a little bit more about what Section 15 says. And I went through these judgments, in, uh, including the judgment in Thibodeau, and one thing I didn't find cited anywhere in any of those judgments was Section 15.2. Everybody's forgotten about it. It's part of it. it. It's part of the very definition. Let's take a look at what Section 15 says. In particular, Section 15.2, and I'll read it to you. It'll be in the paper you eventually get. It says, section subsection 1 does not preclude any law, program, or activity that has as its object the amelioration of conditions of disadvantaged individuals or groups, include, including those that are disadvantaged because of race, national, or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. The very concept of discrimination excludes the prospect of affirmative action 
programs. In other words, those are not discriminatory. Discrimination is the action of the state in drawing a distinction against a disadvantaged group, perpetuating that disadvantage. That's what Andrews says. Very simple, basic, purist Andrews analysis. Why is it that in the broadest possible sense, precluding the state from doing that is going to somehow uh, preclude the legislature from getting on with its legitimate business? This is the premise of the, uh, of the approach that's taken by Laforé and Gantier, and nowhere do they explain why it is this floodgate will open and all of a sudden the legitimate business of the legislature will come crashing to a halt. Think of it, what, what distinctions are out there in our legislation, aside from the one that's being confronted in Egan, which, which is going to lead to some avalanche of claims being brought? And I, I sat and pondered this, and it, it occurred to me that there are two kinds of situation. One is what might be called situational. Uh, that is, a, a specific problem arises. We go to war against a country for what, uh, whatever reason, and legislation is passed which is hostile to the foreign nationals of the country against which we are at war. And I would think facially that would be contrary to Section 15. Um, and, uh, and in that case, the state would be required to provide a justification under Section 1. Um, and uh, under certain circumstances, presumably the state would be able to do that, and under others they wouldn't. But the, what would be so difficult for government, and what would be so, uh, so wrong about requiring the state to provide such a justification? Then there are generic situations. We do have legislation that, of course, discriminates against people on impermissible grounds. Blind people are not allowed to drive. Now, if you follow the, the analysis of uh, Mr. Justice Laforé and Mr. Justice uh, Gantier, a law which says that blind people can't drive isn't discriminatory. It reflects a, an underlying biological reality. All that blind people can't see and people who can't see are dangerous drivers. Now, is that the correct analysis? Or is the correct analysis that of course it draws a distinction against blind people. Blind people have been historically disadvantaged. This works to their disadvantagement, but it's clearly justified under section one. And it's an intuitive se section one case. But we can imagine a situation where uh, a whole range of persons who are now legally blind in the sense that they cannot see well enough to drive a car or to conduct their lives in, a, uh, in the way that persons with sight do, that technology could advance to the point where those people are able to drive. It's possible. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's possible. Does that mean that all of a sudden, um, uh, under Section 15, it becomes discriminatory, where it wasn't before, or is there, in fact, now no longer a Section 1 defense. In my view, it, it's under the Section 1 defense that at that stage the state would no longer be able to justify what is now an intuitive Section 1 defense. But what are the range of circumstances where we have these laws which are going to produce an avalanche of litigation that, uh, that, uh, that hammer the, uh, the, the poor old legislature uh, into a position where it cannot effectively conduct its business? There are two areas. One is uh, in, in respect to gender uh, discrimination, and particularly with respect to constructive discrimination rather than formal discrimination. And the other is on the basis of sexual orientation, where if, if, if Egan goes the other way, um, it is quite arguable that a, a whole area of family law is going to have to be rewritten to accommodate same-sex couples. Um, and uh, in, in my view, what happened in Egan is that exactly what happened in Bowers and Hardwick in the United States, which was the sodomy case in 1985, was that an entire line of jurisprudence uh, led inevitably, if it was followed in any kind of a systematic and reasonable fashion, inevitably led to a result that people didn't like, or at least a core of people didn't like. And that in this case, uh, the, uh, the gang of four, the four minority judges, whatever we want to call them, didn't like the result and fashioned a jurisprudence to avoid it which completely ran, ran roughshod over the basic principles of equality jurisprudence that have gone before. And they've tried to tie it back in to Andrews, but, but they, they do, in, in my view, they are completely unpersuasive in doing so. Now, I'm going to respond effectively directly to, uh, to, to what Peter said on these points, not because I'm debating him, but because I was going to do this anyway. The, the two comments are the two principles in the analysis of Laforet and Gantier, which lead to what I say is an excursion into natural law, uh, are the question of, of whether or not the personal difference is relevant 
and secondly, a contextual analysis. And I agree that both the, the, the phrase, relevant personal difference, clearly is found in Andrews, and I think it has content. And secondly, that, uh, that, uh, that Turpin and, and indeed our, the range of equality cases require a contextual approach to assessing the claims, but not in the fashion that is done by uh, Justices Lafleury and Gantier. The phrase irrelevant personal difference in Andrews, which is an introductory phrase, is used as a normative statement about the groups which are protected under Section 15. It is declarative of the nature of the innate characteristics which are the subject of protection. It is not a description of or, or an analytical tool for analyzing the legislation which is said to impugn or, or, or to somehow um, discriminate. So what they've done is they've taken the, the word irrelevant and, and instead of using it as a normative tool for, for understanding the nature of discrimination, what it is like to have somebody draw a distinction against you because of your race, your sexual orientation, and instead they've asked whether or not the legislature had a reason for drawing a distinction on that basis. So they've simply taken the word and lifted it over to the next part of the analysis. There is no authority for doing that until, um, uh, until we uh, run into the, the Miron Trudel and the, uh, uh, the Egan decision. Secondly, this issue of context. The decision of Mr. Justice Lafore is absolutely remarkable in that it nowhere considers the position of uh, gays and lesbians in Canadian society. It's absolutely silent on the point. There is no consideration of the impact of the exclusion of gay couples, lesbian couples, from recognition either as common law or as, uh, as married persons. Not one sentence. Now that clearly is inconsistent with the analysis in Andrews which says you have to examine the entire context to determine the impact of the law on the affected group. Instead, what they're doing is saying we have to look at the entire context to understand why Parliament passed this law. What's the purpose of this law? Now, what makes it even more of a reach is the nature of the legislation itself. The legislation itself in Egan uh, was a, uh, the definition of spouse, which included married couples and common law spouses. Common law spouses had to be living together for a minimum period of one year. The very essence of the defense of this as non-discrimination is that this supports the family, the married couple marriage. The fact that it extends to common law couples is merely an incident of the historic development uh, of extension of benefits that Parliament has, has chosen to do. It's not necessary, but Parliament has chosen to do it. Why is it that same-sex couples are excluded from this protection because they fall outside the definition of marriage? So it, it, that's where the circularity come, c comes in. You're not married, you can't be married, because you're outside the definition of marriage, and it's not discriminatory because it's just because of the definition of marriage. That's called a tautology, um, and, and quite a simple one. Uh, and it's, 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 it's more naked in the judgment of Saudi and Leyland, um, uh, where he points out the inherent absurdity of this argument by saying this doesn't discriminate against gays and lesbians. Gays and lesbians can marry as long as they marry people of the opposite sex. There is nothing in our law that prevents that. I mean, we're laughing here about that statement, but it's appalling. I mean, it's absolutely appalling. What is it that we really mean? by being married. What is it that we mean by a spouse? And I, I just pointed it to the decision of LaRue de Bay and Mossop, um, but we don't need to do that. I mean, we can ask these, uh, these judges what they understand by marriage. If you say to, uh, whether it's Justice Lafaure or, or, or anybody else who's making these decisions, would you say that your marriage is about making children? And I hope they'd say no. I hope, I, I hope they'd say that was part of it. Uh, for those who, who have or intend to have children. But the relationship itself between two people is what is at the essence of, um, uh, of spousedom, whether you have children or you don't have children. Now, this is why we see the scrambling around in the decision as well to, uh, to, to, by, by Mr. Justice Lafaure to say that he's not troubled by the fact that not all heterosexual couples can or do have children. 
that they at least have the potential to have children or they resemble a domestic arrangement that has the potential to have children. It's sort of like a prize for coming close. Uh, whereas same-sex couples do not, in any sense, resemble this. Um, th this is, uh, going back to what Mary Everett said before, uh, this is exactly the sort of analysis we would have expected to see under the Bill of Rights of sort of labeling. You're in this category, you're not. Um, why? Well, because you don't resemble the category. Well, why not? Well, because I say you don't. Um, and if pressed, I will tell you that it's a fundamental value or a biological reality. And that, that is the essence of the reasoning. Egan, uh, this is a, 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 a moving on to a slightly different point, but Egan, when I read it, um, first of all, this is a, this is a war story. Uh, we had a press conference uh, arranged for about an hour after the Egan decision came out, and I got a telephone call from a friend in the media who told me we had lost the case, um, but uh, didn't tell me, uh, at five to four, but didn't tell me who or where or when or why, and nobody had read the decision. So I stood by the fax machine reading the head note as it came out, um, and uh, to, to try to decide how the decision had gone. And the, the first decision, or the first reasons that came out were, uh, uh, the head note I think were from uh, uh, Justice Lafourie. Uh, the, the next were from Justice LaRue de Bay, and, and, uh, and then from Corey, and then it became evident that most of the members of the court had written something. Uh, and I had to figure it out while I was running up to City Hall, and we finally worked it out, and nobody's bothered well, I shouldn't say this, we haven't dwelt on this today, but the result of the case, uh, we said, was two wins and a draw. And I, I think Peter is right uh, in saying that uh, the decision in Egan, uh, actually uh, the, the majority is with Corey on Section 15.1, um, and that that's a very important point to make. But when you read the decisions, it reminded me of an academic paper um, written lightheartedly, I think it was by Carl Llewellyn, called The Case of the Spelunkian Explorers. Um, and I'll, I'll put the citation in my paper. And it's published in the Harvard Law Review. It was back in the, I think it was in the 30s or in the 50s. It's a hypothetical example, but what he did, it's a work of jurisprudence. What he did was he posited a fact situation of some people who went off uh, hiking in a cave and unfortunately there was a rock slide which covered up the entrance and people couldn't get to them. They had little radios so they could talk to people on the other side, but it was gonna be three weeks before they could be dug out and uh, you know, by that time they'd all have starved to death. And they wanted to know whether or not they could draw lots and, uh, and, and kill uh, the person who lost and, and eat them so that they could survive and at least some of them would be alive when the rescue party got there. And all the wise men of the land and wise women of the land got together and couldn't decide what the right answer was. Uh, the party went ahead and did it. Uh, and then, of course, were all charged with murder. And this was the decision of the highest court of the land on whether or not uh, they were liable for murder. Uh, and there were five different decisions that were written, all from a different philosophical jurisprudential point of view. You had the natural law lawyers, you had the positive lawyers, and then at the end of the day, you had a lawyer, who, uh, lawyer or a judge who, who you don't actually see write decisions. Uh, and that decision said, oh dear, oh dear, it's all very troubling. I see the merits in what everybody is saying. I just can't decide. And that's what Mr. Justice Sapinka did. Um, the, uh, and I'm, I'm being a little bit flippant with what he, what he said there, but th that's effectively what he said, not now, maybe later. Uh, and I've never seen a case that split in quite the same way, paralleling the Spelunkian Explorers. If you read it, you'll get a kick out of it, I think. I want to, uh, before moving back to the philosophical analysis, I want to tell you what's happened with the law since Egan. Um, many of you probably know this. We have given you the decisions in here in Vogel, which is in the Manitoba Court of Appeal, and it's at tab J of your materials. At pages uh, two to three, uh, it's a unanimous decision of the Manitoba Court of Appeal. Um, the, uh, at pages two to three, the court finds, and in, in, in my view, correctly so, that the uh, decision in Egan determines that failure to accord same-sex couples benefits, uh, equal benefits to opposite-sex couples, constitutes discrimination. Um, and uh, that decision five to four, and it's binding on the Manitoba Court of Appeal. In the Vogel case, uh, it is an interpretation of the Manitoba uh, Human Rights Act, or Human Rights Code, which does not contain a section one limitation. 
um, as does the charter, and as a result, uh, the the impact um, in the Vogel case is different, and the the claim was remitted back to the referee to um, uh, to presumably uh, decide on the basis that there was discrimination. So that's one appellate court that has said yes, um, that uh, they they agree that the Supreme Court of Canada has decided that this is discrimination. On the other side of the coin, uh, and we've given you this decision as well, at the next tab is the QP case, or the Rosenberg case. This is a case brought to challenge the definition of spouse under the Income Tax Act. In this case, I, am, I, I don't know whether a notice of appeal has been launched yet, but I'm sure this will go up. Um, this case went effectively the other way, also purporting to follow Egan. Um, in, in this case, the, the claimants take the position I'll well, give you the background. The Income Tax Act has the effect of saying that benefits plans and pensions plans that don't correspond with the definition um, will not be registered and as a result will not, uh, will not have the benefit of a tax-exempt status. So if you're an employer offering benefits to your employees and you want to offer the same benefits to your same-sex uh, or your, your, your gay and lesbian employees, if you do so, arguably under these plans, they become deregistered and everybody has to pay tax on these benefits, which, uh, which would have had preferential tax uh, treatment before. The effect is not that the government is failing to extend a benefit to same-sex couples, but it's impeding private actors from doing so by the way it has structured the Income Tax Act. Uh, and in the trial decision, um, uh, Justice Charon has found that Egan is binding, uh, which presumably is good law, uh, which means that, uh, that it's discriminatory, but it's saved under Section 1, in his view, based on the, uh, the reasoning in the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, and uh, as I say, presumably that case will go up, uh, A, on the basis that, uh, uh, that this does not involve the expenditure of public funds in, in the same way that Egan does, um, and B, that although the, the time wasn't right five years ago, the time is now right, and so thank God it changed his mind. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. I have also given you at the end, at uh, tab L, a copy of Bowers and Hardwick. Uh, the reason that is there is the basis on which, uh, the basis on which in the Supreme Court of the United States found that the Georgia sodomy law was constitutional. Um, and I'm going to come back to this in just a minute when I get to uh, a closer reading of what Justice Gontier said in his decision. In fact, I'll do it now. If you want to follow along, Gontier's de or the uh, decision is at I think it's at I. Yep, tab I. No, the decision of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah, of Mr. Justice Gontier and Miron Trudel is at tab I, at least in my book it is. Now, I'm just going to point out highlights. These are sort of editorial comments of what uh, Justice Gauthier said, which reinforces the points that I made earlier about the shift in focus. I'm taking the analytical concepts that are in Andrews, but then focusing on uh, not the claimant, but society or the legislature. And on page I-18, and I'm just going to hop through the judgment and then come to Loving in Virginia, which, I have, which Mayo raised and I have a couple of comments on as well. Under paragraph 21, uh, this is where Justice Gante is talking about the importance of biological realities and fundamental values, and notes how it was recognized in the McKinney case, about how, it, how fundamental to personal self-worth employment is, fundamental value, it's the fundamental value to the claimant. The analysis that we see in Gante's judgment is a fundamental value to society as a whole. This implies a unified vision within society about what is fundamental and important. Marriage is not fundamental to everybody in this society, by any means. There are lots of people who don't like it. And what, what Justice Gontier is doing is finding a fundamental value in our entire society 
rather than locating the fundamental values in the, in the claimants. Now, what is ironic when you, you stick the Gantier judgment beside the Lafaure one? is a key, a pivotal aspect of Gantier's judgment is that marriage is a voluntary institution. People enter into it by choice. It's contractual in nature. And when you choose to enter into it, various incidents flow as a result of legislation. But, but anyone can choose to enter it. Of course, except same-sex couples, which he doesn't say in his decision. And La Forêt does not advert to the fact that the, the estate, which, uh, which is an issue in that case, is not one that gay persons can voluntarily choose to enter into. So in, in terms of the impact of the legislation, if Gantier is correct, I don't think he is, but I think it's at least more arguable that, that, uh, that common law couples have chosen not to undertake the benefits and, and the obligations of marriage the same cannot be said for same-sex couples who do not have the choice of entering into that legally recognized contractual relationship. And Gantier then is at great pains to explain how fundamental and important um, committed domestic relationships are to the well-being of individuals and society as a whole. And he's not here just focusing on the capacity to procreate and the rearing of children. Indeed, if you look at the quotations, and it starts at page one, uh, I-19, No, I'm sorry, it starts at page uh, I-24. You can skip the, uh, it's paragraph 41 and following, you can skip the quotation from Maynard and Hill, not because it's unhelpful, but it's 19th century, and I'm, I'm a little loath to rely on any 19th century views of what marriage ought to be and um, go to Mr. Justice Douglas's words in um, uh, paragraph 42. We deal with a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school system. Marriage is a coming together for better or for worse, hopefully enduring and intimate to the degree of being sacred. There's an association that promotes a way of life, not causes, a harmony in living, not political faiths, a bilateral loyalty not commercial or social projects. Yet it is an association for as noble a purpose as any involved in our prior decisions. And then the quotation from Loving in Virginia, the freedom to marry has long been recognized as one of the vital personal rights essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men, close quote. These, these are strong statements about the importance of, 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 of a private institution to personal happiness, and they don't say anything there about producing children. Of course, they, they may, there may or may not be children in, in a marriage. I, I think it's astounding that Justice Gante would invoke these two cases in support for um, his uh, definition or, or support of, of traditional marriage. Uh, Mr. Justice Doug Douglas in Griswold is, is the famous privacy case which effectively says uh, the state should not be uh, intruding into the private lives of its citizens, particularly in the domestic context, where those choices of, of free association and, and, and the, way, uh, the way domestic life is lived uh, are, are so fundamental to personal happiness. That was the case for, for uh, striking down a law that prohibited contraception within marriage. And as, uh, as uh, Professor Moran has pointed out, uh, loving in Virginia is about the fundamental right of people to choose to whom they will be married, and, and about the unconstitutionality of the state interjecting um, a, uh, a regulation that prohibits you from marrying the person you want to marry. He invokes these decisions to support the concept, the proposition, that marriage is a fundamental personal institution. La Forêt, in adopting them, is using them to support the position that they should be denied to same-sex couples without analyzing the underlying reasoning or the inherent contradiction in those two, uh, in those two basic principles. <laughs> 
I searched around for some academic commentary that would support the approach that Laforet and Gantier uh, have taken in these cases. And I did find one. Um, and it's, uh, I'll give you the citation. It's J.M. Finnis. Um, and it's in the Notre Dame Journal of Law, Ethics, and Public Policy. And I, the, the citation will be in the paper, which I will send to you. John Finnis is perhaps the only living natural law lawyer. Um, he's rumored to be 200 years old. I'm being facetious. Uh, I'm being facetious. But, but the, the, the basic principles which guide his understanding um, come straight out of, uh, out of a, a, a very Catholic view of natural law. His hero is Germain Grisez, who sort of wrote the treatise on the proper way uh, to, uh, to live your life as a Catholic. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a towering work, and if you're a Catholic and you believe it, I think it's wonderful. Um, but uh, what it says is uh, probably only cogent to people who do believe that. Um, and uh, you have to query what the position of that kind of reasoning is in a, in a secular society. This is the intellectual origin of what we see in Laferre's judgment and Gantier's judgment. It's overt Catholicism. Uh, it's, the, it's the application of a traditional concept of marriage to the exclusion of difference. And it is a basic denial of the liberal principles which are inherent in the charter itself. In fact, they're using principles that are uh, external to the charter uh, in order to effectively kill charter analysis for equality rights. You can be equal as long as you do not offend our fundamentally held views. In an introduction to this book, I mean, Notre Dame is, of course, a Catholic university. I thought the point was put much better, or the debate was put much better by John Robinson, who, uh, who is actually, he's saying, look, we're all Catholic lawyers here. How do we confront these difficult contemporary uh, philosophical and ethical issues? This is what he said. The result is that we moderns come to doubt the moral propriety of uh, patriarchy, for example. We find that we cannot resolve that doubt by reference to scripture and tradition. They are both influenced by the same uh, patriarchalism that we are questioning, and that the, yet the mode of that influence is such that we would be supremely unwise to regard either scripture or tradition as validating for us. We find ourselves in a similar quandary as we reconsider the close nexus between morally permissible sexual activity and reproduction, nexus that the tradition has handed down to us. Is that nexus an ineluctable implication of the gospel message, or is it an understandable but no longer relevant feature of the cultures in which that message was first articulated and later systematized? Neither scripture nor tradition answers that sort of question for us, so we must answer it for ourselves. That's a much more thoughtful and, I think, North American approach uh, in the Catholic communities consider, uh, uh, considering these issues. But it has no place in the Supreme Court of Canada. And you could hear Leviticus shrieking out in the background as a subtext to this decision. It just wasn't named. That, that's what the fundamental value is there. It says, nature, uh, marriage is by nature heterosexual and any uh, benefit which parliament, and, and this is effectively what they're saying, any benefit which parliament accords to married couples or couples who look like married couples in common law, that is defensible because it supports this fundamental institution. My submission, that's not good enough. You have to look at the impact of these distinctions on the groups which are affected. And that brings me full circle back to section 15. I read to you section 15.2 to start, and uh, I come back to it and say that, all right, if we presume for a moment that Parliament is entitled to draw distinctions in favor of domestic couples on the basis of their coupledom, that dyads may be, domestic dyads may be favored, that this is, whether it's central to public, public policy or, or just defensible, that this may be done. Presumably, this means that uh, this is a group which is entitled to additional support. Uh, and I think that can be argued as the traditional uh, place where children are raised and expenses are incurred in doing that, and that the state has a legitimate interest in doing that. That does not justify uh, 
Parliament in drawing a distinction within that general category, which is itself discriminatory. And this is the, this is the fundamental section 15.2 analysis. It's possible to create benefits programs that assist people that are perfectly valid under section 15.2, but that doesn't give you the right to draw disc discriminatory distinctions within those programs. I'll give you an example. If the state wants to create a scholarship program to uh, assist uh, First Nations women to go to university, well, clearly that program is discriminating against men. Well, not exactly a historically disadvantaged group. Maybe it's discriminating against native men, but uh, it would be possible to, uh, to mount a defense that, uh, uh, that native women have been particularly hard done by. It's discriminating against other ethnic minorities which have had difficulty attaining higher education, but because it is furthering the purpose uh, of specifically advancing the position of native women, uh, perhaps that would be defensible. Would it be defensible if it was only available to married native women? I think that'd be pretty difficult to defend. Similarly, within, within the, the benefit scheme which offers benefits to conjugal couples, Parliament has drawn a distinction between conjugal and non-conjugal. You may argue that that is not a legitimate distinction, but for, for argument's sake, let's say that it is. It has gone on to say that the sexual identity of the two partners is another distinction that can be drawn. It's a separate distinction, clearly severable from the others. And in my submission, that has to be a distinction which can be justified as well. And the entire scheme doesn't topple when you pull that one toothpick out of it. Those are my general thoughts on, on the cases. Um, I, I think we'll throw the floor open to questions generally or discussion. Yeah. I mean, and I think we should throw this open to everybody to make a comment on it. I think it's going to depend very much on the, on the circumstances of the legislation because th these distinctions are drawn in programs that govern the relationships between people in a, in, in a relationship in that purely private context and in their dealings with others. And then it also regulates the, the obligations and benefits publicly. Um, I think the claim would be incoherent in certain contexts. For instance, uh, insider trading, you have an obligation to, uh, to report uh, uh, trading that your spouse does if you hold a certain, uh, a certain position. This is an obligation, you know, of course we're talking about benefits and burdens at the same time. Um, consent to treatment in the hospital, it, it, I think it would be an incoherent claim uh, for somebody to come along and, and somehow raise a claim that even though they don't have any relationship with the person who's in the hospital, they ought to, uh, ought to be favored. But I take your question as being more focused at the allocation of public benefits. Uh, 
uh, and somebody saying it, hey, why should this group be privileged because there's something called a family and, and I'd be excluded because I'm not. Well, that's, I mean, in Sweden, they allocate benefits and burdens on the basis of, 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 of personhood, not, not spousehood, uh, or uh, at least they approximate that. Uh, and, and, and there may be an argument to be made on that basis. Um, that goes back to the distinction of whether or not um, Parliament should be drawing a distinction based on conjugality at all. I think that's open to argument. Our position, this is the, the easy case is this, from litigating same-sex benefits, is not, we're not saying you should or you shouldn't award benefits on the basis of conjugality. We're saying if you do it, if you make that choice, you've got to include us. Because we're exactly the same as you guys are. And you've got to come up with a more coherent reason to exclude us because the, the only reason that you've offered uh, and the, the only reason that, uh, that I find in the decisions is uh, we've decided that you're not like us. That's our fundamental value. So I think they're distinct questions. Why don't I throw it open to everybody else? Um, one of the things that was quite interesting, just pull this over. One of the things that was quite interesting in the uh, Egan case is that the, the, the legislative record made it very clear that the intention really was not even to give money to spouses. The real legislative intention was to give money to a group of predominantly impoverished women between the ages of 60 and 65. And, and that's why this case was quite interesting, you know, getting rid of all of this constitutional theory, is, is that you had Parliament basically saying, we're going to give a benefit to a group of needy, vulnerable, socially and historically disadvantaged 60 to 65-year-old women who were poor. Um, now, they didn't do that. If they'd done it that way, would it have been a clear 15 violation but justifiable under one and we wouldn't have had all of this intriguing dialogue, um, but would it be any more or less offensive? Because they've chosen the spouse category, which is such a value-laden term and, and has all of these larger issues, you know, is any more or less difficult. One of the, the arguments that the court dealt with is, well, let's say that you expand the category of spouse to include same-sex spouses, what about the point you've raised? What about two people who are not spouses, but say we are equally impoverished and equally as entitled to the benefit and we've been cut out? And so one of the issues that, 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 that arises is, you know, how, how broad does the 15 inquiry go? Because is the idea of spouse outmoded? And do we talk about domestic partnerships? Of course, if we talk domestic partnerships, then do we undermine you know, any form of commitment in society which is associated with spousal. So the, the issues seem to get more complicated rather than less. Can I just pick up on that? Because I think it's a very common theme in the equality cases, which is that what we're really talking about is whether or not and the extent to which the courts can look behind the reason for the, the choice of the criteria. You said at the, at the outset of your comments that the question is really how do you define spouse and how do you define marriage and how do you define family? I don't think that's the question at all. I think that the question under equality analysis, I mean, that, that's a, that is a question. It's a nice question, an important question. Important question of social development and all sorts of other neat things. It's not an equality rights question. The equality rights question I would submit under Section 15 is, is why is the state using, or should the state use, or can the state use this criteria for allocating benefits? I would argue that from Andrews, and really from the text of the charter itself, in section 15, the judges are asked to inquire on the impact of the law and the use of the law in respect of the individual. Section 15 guarantees rights to individuals, and I would submit that at the section 15 part of the analysis, the question should be, has this individual been treated with concern and respect, or is this individual being treated on the basis of a stereotype by virtue of association with a group? and that other questions of justification ought to arise only at the later stage. So to come back to the question, why is the state not using the question of dependency? The evidence was clear that at the time this was a good thing to adopt the spouse's allowance because older women uh, were poor. When they lost their husband's pension, they by and large had no independent pension, they by and large dropped out of the workforce. The single largest identifiable group of poor people in the country were, were elderly women. Well, they're now being overtaken, as I understand it, by single mothers. Uh, but at the time of the adoption of the spousal allowance, undoubtedly it was a good thing, a social, a progressive social measure. Now the question is, there's a group 
here that fall just outside that line. And the real equality question, I think, is whether or not as a society it's acceptable to allow the state to classify people by virtue of their marital status, or whether we should be saying you're using the wrong cipher. You're trying to get at issues of dependency by saying married people are dependent. People living in common law relationships are dependent. Instead of looking at issues of dependency, we're going to look at issues, uh, uh, we're going to simply use the general marker, the general criteria of marital status. What we're saying in the equality cases is, th is that an appropriate marker to use or not? I think that's the real question. And there, there are questions of context that are important. There are, there are questions of, of uh, justification that can be uh, important. I think, uh, to a large extent, the in the trilogy, we're paying for the mistakes of the, of the court, or the court's paying for its own mistakes. I think Andrews was overly ambitious. It was the wrong case to try to adopt that, that uniform standard. I think that by, by trying to apply Andrews in cases like Hess, the court found itself in difficulty. And as a consequence of that now, there's this splintering and, and a review. It may be that a more cautious approach to the development of Section 15 would have led to a more lasting jurisprudence, because I think I agree with the point that I think that Mary made, and that Mayo made, which is that this is not really very enduring. If this is constitutional jurisprudence, it really ought to have a shelf life of longer than 12 or 15 months or 24 months or 36 months, but it really hasn't. Now, we used to teach constitutional law and look at the evolution of division of powers decade by decade which is a very interesting way to look at it if you divide the life of the court and division of powers from 1867 to, say, 1982. Right now, we're looking at equality cases, not month by month, but certainly year by year, uh, and saying that the, the, the doctrines really aren't, don't, don't seem to be providing a useful framework for analysis for, for a very long time. And I think that that's partly because the court is, is mixing the types of analysis that it ought to be doing. It's not, it shouldn't be defining spouse. I would stand up and argue against the court trying to engage in a comprehensive definition of spousedom or spousalhood or whatever you'd call it. I think that the question is, is this an appropriate criteria for the state to be using in exercising its power? That's the equality question, I think. And I think that as long as you keep that, uh, that focus, um, then the Section 15 analysis is a little bit easier to, to undertake and the types of questions that are appropriate are easier to undertake. And Andrews, I think, says that the, gr the list of grounds are presumptively irrelevant. That's what they mean when they say irrelevant personal characteristics. What, what the, the minority of four have ignored is the fact that uh, McIntyre goes on to say that any, character or any classification on the basis of those listed or analogous grounds ought to be uh, very difficult to defend, whereas one that doesn't touch it will be much more easy to defend. He's indicating that there ought to be presumptions at work. And I think those presumptions derive from common social experience about how, discriminates, how discrimination operates in the society, which is also something that the minority of four don't seem to pay a lot of attention to. Mary, do you have thoughts on this point? Well, I, I guess I'd go a little bit uh, uh, more, more broadly still. Um, I guess one of the questions for me is, whatever our definition of spouse, uh, why does it have to be spouse or near spouse or common law spouse? Um, if there are elderly people and they are in need, what's the differentiation, what's the basis for differentiating between them and people who are in family units? There are lots of old women who are poor because they had lousy jobs working um, at, uh, in public institutions when uh, women were expected to be supported by their husbands or by their families. Uh, they worked in um, retail outlets where there were no pensions for women. Uh, they worked in part-time employment where they had no benefits at all. And they might have been uh, single throughout their lives, or they might have been um, divorced years ago and uh, suffered the fallout of uh, you know, poverty from, from that experience. So why does it have to be spouse at all? And, if, and uh, I think we have to, um, one of the things that we have to grapple with from the Egan case is uh, a very fundamental idea that uh, I think Justices Corey and Iacobucci take issue with, uh, but nobody really knows how to figure it out. On the one hand, we say that the Charter will not make Parliament pass a law. Um, you know, you can't say, I have a right to life here, and, and the fetus has a right to life, and therefore there should be criminal prohibitions against abortion, uh, if there are none. And on the other hand, the courts have said at one stage, well, you don't have to legislate, but if you do embark on legislation, then you can't have unconstitutional legislation. 
And then Sapinka comes along and picks up what the court said in McKinney, saying, well, you don't have to solve the social problems all at once, you can do it incrementally. So what's the difference between not having to start anything at all on the one hand, and on the other hand, if you start it, you have to get it right, but with this temporal element that maybe will give you a few years to get it right. So, and I, and I say this question about spousal status for the benefits recipients is in there. I mean, what about single people? Isn't that discrimination on the basis of marital status, even if you have an expanded definition of spouse, so that everybody, homosexual, heterosexual, who's living together, gets a benefit. Well, what about all the poor people who are old and single? Um, so, and this uh, issue was raised and, and sort of scrapped over by uh, Sapinka, Corey, and Yakabuchi, but um, it's a really fundamental issue of charter jurisprudence that we uh, should be seeing more of because uh, I think unless people figure out this question outside of the court, the next time it comes to the court, we'll all founder on it. Yeah, I, I agree, and I guess that one of the things you asked was, um, should that happen under Section 1? And, and I think it should happen under Section 1. I mean, one of the things that's troubling about the um, a group of four in, in Miro and Egan is that um, they carry on their analysis basically of the justification of the legislative distinction without any of the disciplines that Section 1 imposes on that analysis. I mean, there are evidentiary requirements, there are burdens, that sort of thing under Section 1. None of that is present in Section 15, and so I think there's a great danger of carrying on that inquiry under Section 15 without the restrictions that Section 1 places on the analysis. Um, I just also wanted to mention that when I was doing some of the reading for this and, and looking at the case of the U.S. Supreme Court in, in Loving v. Virginia, um, one of the things that the court was worried about was whether or not um, all the other distinctions based on marriage were going to fall as a result of finding this particular arrangement unconstitutional. And actually, from the perspective of slippery slope arguments, it's interesting to look at what what concerns there were raised in the, in the more general writing at the time. For example, people said, well, you know, we don't need to worry about finding this unconstitutional because we will still be able to uphold the prohibition on epileptics marrying. That was a reason in favor of the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in, in Loving v. Virginia. And there were other examples of voluntary sterilization um, so the court was sort of saying, don't worry, we're still protecting these areas. We look at that now and we think, should have they been protecting that? I mean, I think there's an important need to kind of question the basis of the distinction here, as, as Mary and Bill suggested. Any other questions? It's all that clear, yes? <laughs> I have some thoughts, but let's start elsewhere today, or today, this question. Um, who wants to kick off? Go. I think I would start by connecting it with the uh, tradition of viewing the child as an appendage of the parent, um, and the, the evolution of the, the development of uh, views about children's rights sometimes being different than their parents' rights, and children's interests being different than their, children's, uh, than their parents' interests. So that I would, I would think that if you can connect it with those general 
situations of disadvantage. The age discrimination cases on behalf of children that I've looked at have generally founded because they've tended to be brought by relatively well-off children seeking to get better off or relatively well-off parents seeking to get better off by shedding uh, a burden of their children or obtaining a benefit for their children. It's, it seems to me there are some classic cases where uh, uh, a QC litigated on behalf of his children um, out west. It's, it's not a very happy tale in equality land, I think. Um, so I think that the, the trick is to try to understand this as as failing to meet the needs of children who are living out of their homes for whatever reason and who are therefore in need and trying to connect them with a group of, of children who have suffered discrimination. That's where the equality claims so far have foundered and that's why they haven't got to section one. But I would have thought that a purist Andrews approach would say that th we ought to look at the reasons why the check goes to the parents and why children are forbidden from claiming on their own and inquire into whether or not there are less discriminatory means of achieving uh, those goals. The same thing is true in, in respect of the GST rebate, that uh, children are presumed to be dependent on their parents up to a certain age. And despite all of the facts that would show that a child may be living separate and apart from his or her parents, receiving welfare uh, in all sorts of other ways, independent from the family unit, still can't obtain the GST tax rebate because although they're poor, they're, they're presumed because they're under an age 19, still to be dependent on their parents. We've got to look at that group as a distinct set of uh, of children and look at the purpose of the legislation as furthering the view of child as appendage of parent in order to get over the section 15 hurdle, but I think the right evidence could be brought to show that. Anyone want to add anything? I just wasn't clear what the questioner is trying to do. Is she trying to uphold the distinction or, I mean, what, what, are, what are you I doing here? I mean, my view is that you do have to deal with it under Section 1, and I'll tell you why. I think the, the case of the two-year-old is easy. Again, there's an intuitive Section 1 defense there um, in almost any circumstance. We don't provide a guaranteed minimum income in this country for everybody. Uh, if we did that, I would see no reason why children wouldn't get it too. Um, but uh, uh, what do you do when they're 15? Why, why can you not measure circumstances by looking at the extent to which the child is factually dependent on their parent or in a situation where the parent ought to be the one making those decisions or not? It's not the 15-year-old. It's the person living separate and apart from his or her home where there's often been, in the, in the child context, some state intervention that's already in some sense sanctioned that or at least reviewed that whether it's by the schools, whether it's by the welfare authorities, whether it's, there's all sorts of ways in which that gets itself worked out in this society in respect of children. So you've got one arm of the state saying, yes, you ought to live separate and apart from your family, and another arm of the state saying, no, no, you ought to be subsumed within. It's a, the Thibodeau question. You can't get free of the family uh, in terms of the issue with the welfare check. Why do you need the blanket rule, and why not individualize it? Is there something so fundamentally intrusive or impractical about individualizing it? Those to me are section one questions, and I think that's really where the debate ought to work itself out. And it's not as easy as I've put it, obviously, because there are, when you actually look at the, the costs associated with an individual assessment, it may be both more intrusive and more discretionary and therefore less helpful than the, the class-based rule. But I think those are the sorts of line drawing questions that our court ought to be able to engage in under Section 1 uh, and review. I can give you an analogy. I mean, there, the, the Parliament's engaged in line drawing, which is going to be arbitrary at the, at the margins. It always is when you're talking about age limits. You know, why, why can people start to drive at 16 instead of 15? Why isn't the age 17? I mean, you, you cannot mount a, a coherent, logical case that 17 and 16, that there, you know, there's some huge difference there. 
and, and this is going to fall into the same category. I argued the age of consent case um, uh, for anal intercourse, uh, and there was a different age of consent for anal intercourse than for uh, other forms of sexual expression. It was 18, and all other sexual conduct is 14. It's consensual. Um, and, uh, and the Crown stood up and said, look, it's an exercise in line, line drawing, and uh, Parliament has to draw the line somewhere. And, and the argument was, well, look, first of all, there are two lines being drawn here, and you have to justify that. And secondly, the line drawing has to at least be defensible. There has to be, a de you have to be able to say that this is at least in the range of being reasonable. And uh, the general age of consent for sex is four I mean, 14, right? Maybe it is, maybe it, maybe it should be 16, maybe it should be 12. It's different places in different parts of the world. Uh, in, in terms of when you're going to recognize the legal personality of a young person, um, you, you may set some sort of a minimum age at which they'd be entitled to receive the money, um, but it certainly wouldn't be 19. I mean, I don't think you'd find too many judges who'd say that, you know, a child must be forced to live at home and not have an independent legal identity to receive, uh, receive uh, support from the state until 19. Um, if, if I can just, you know, the task that, that, uh, that David assigned to me this morning was, you know, try to, try to f explain the, the rationale of these four minority justices. And, and just using this as an example, I think that, that it's probably less offensive to, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people to say, well, do we have to get into section one on some of these cases um, where there's sort of some fundamental good sense that perhaps a two-year-old shouldn't be getting welfare directly? You know, it, is that a section one issue that require, especially given the arbitrariness under so much section one analysis? You know, line drawing is okay in Irwin Toy. It's not okay in the case David just talked about. I'm a little uneasy about when line drawing's okay and not. So I may be a little more comfortable saying, Maybe the Gonti approach is helpful to somebody who, who, uh, who wants to take that approach. A, a child children's rights advocate would say this is an absolutely outrageous statement. Um, I think that the politics of the issue tells us how comfortable we are with the various approaches. And that, of course, is why we've got such a confused state of the law, because the politics of the judges and the issue seems to dictate whether we deal with these issues under 15 or 1. Um, and that's, I think, the problem we've got to deal with is how do we strip the politics out of Section 15 analysis and try to get some tests that's going to work in all the cases? Other questions? Wait. Mm -hmm. Great question. You want to start? I'll start. Um, my initial reaction after uh, reading these judgments was uh, hold the phone here. We'd better uh, get this litigation out of the court uh, uh, pipeline because uh, if other cases start hitting the uh, Supreme Court of Canada desks, uh, they will have the opportunity to go even further with their hollowing out of Section 15. And uh, then I thought uh, that maybe it would be more salutary to actually have more cases go to the trial level uh, and possibly the Court of Appeal, depending on the province, because uh, one of the things that happened, I mean, we have had decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada either um, left on the sidelines or hurriedly reversed uh, once the court has become aware that um, the decisions uh, are not respected. Uh, that happened in uh, Azkoff uh, when they saw the havoc that their categorical um, provision about the, uh, about delay had uh, caused, and they and within uh, a year they had reversed themselves. Um, and there is a lot of uh, sort of incrementalism as they they change their positions around. So, you know, I think. Um, Probably the, the cases that go in the immediate future, like the next six months, will give them the opportunity to flesh out some of this reasoning more. But um, if there are cases that are at the trial level and the court of appeal level, now I, my uh, thought is that we should proceed with them because they have an educated value. And having had the opportunity last week to try to rely on Egan before a judge of the Ontario Court General Division, 
I found she was uh, really not buying the so-called reasoning of the majority in Egan. She gave me a really hard time. Uh, I wasn't very enthusiastic about them anyway. And uh, I thought, well, if she can find a way around this decision, she will. And maybe we should give more judges the chance to do that. Um, because the reasoning is not, uh, by and large, defensible reasoning. Just on that briefly, the, just for the Canadian Human Rights Commission, in terms of same-sex benefits, we're proceeding with a range of cases dealing with the employer's provision of same-sex benefits on the basis that, like Vogel, Egan has no application in respect of that in government's defenses. Government as employer does not have the same range of defenses as government as uh, as legislator. And private employers obviously can't somehow under the, or shelter under the coattails of government acting as legislator. Uh, legislator. There's also a Vreend in the Alberta Court of Appeal, which is a question of whether or not uh, sexual orientation should be read into the Individual Rights Protection Act. Uh, there's no decision for the Court of Appeal, but there's, uh, there is other litigation going on. I think that the, one of the messages from Thibodeau and Symes, though, uh, is that the court is looking for uh, people that it understands to be traditionally uh, victims of discrimination in the society. And I think that the other point that, that uh, is interesting is that the court hasn't yet dealt with disability discrimination, for example. There's a, the first disability uh, case uh, dealing with equality rights is up before the court now in a case called Battlefords and Gibbs, a, a human rights decision uh, under review. So there are more difficult and, and, uh, and profound issues of discrimination that are still to come before the court. It hasn't really confronted the issue of race discrimination and the way it works itself out in legislation yet. And I would expect to see some of those other types of cases being, uh, being brought forward as well. I think the cases are just going to carry on. Your last question. I think everybody can be pushed back to Andrews. I think if you look at CUPE, though, they look at the CUPE decision in there and see what Madam Justice Charon did in, uh, in dealing with the challenge of the Income Tax Act. She was offered an opportunity to say that Egan is different because it's a spouse's allowance, after all. It's a very different type of case and involves the expenditure of state funds. And she chose not to do that. She follows both majorities in Egan, finding it to be discriminatory, and then following the other majority, if you take Lafaudet's uh, throwaway lines on McKinney and Sapinka's decision on Section 1 and finds that although it's discriminatory, it ought to be upheld under Section 1, despite all of the differences. She was offered an armful of differences between the Spouses Allowance and the Income Tax Act provisions dealing with pensions, and yet in, despite all of that, she chose to follow the two majorities and in the end dismissed the charter claim. So if the judge wants to, there is guidance to be found there. We'll see the decisions all over the map. Um, yeah. There was a, a lesbian adoption in the uh, uh, in in London uh, about a week, ten days ago, that was approved by the uh, family court, uh, which is binding on provincial courts across the province, uh, uh, based on the s same sort of reasoning as as MNK. And we're we're, we're going to see decisions in the other way, but uh, on the other side, we're going to have to break now. It's one o'clock, um, and we've run over time. Um, I, before we do, I just I, I, I want to also commend to you uh, Brad Berg's paper, which is in the materials. He said we could republish it. It's from the Journal of National Journal of Constitutional Law and Policy, where he takes uh, sort of the first swipe at the court uh, for the Egan decision, first of what I think will be many from a number of us. Anyway, thank you for coming.